begin our look at Psalm 78. You'll notice it is a longer one. Uh, do not worry. I didn't text you to. I didn't, I didn't text you to bring your, your sleeping bags because I didn't anticipate us to finish this tonight. We'll get a start on it, but I doubt we'll finish it. So we're just going to go at a comfortable clip here. But before we look at Psalm 78, please join me in prayer, won't you? Father, we thank you for your word. The, you have not left us blind. You have not left us uh, without a guide. Your word, the Bible, you have spoken to us. And it's how you have revealed yourself to us. It's how we know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, holy and sinful. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that you will always help us grow in the knowledge and grace of your word, that you would illuminate it for us so that as we read it and study it, that we grow ourselves and that we put it into practice in our very lives as well. As we go through your word tonight, Lord, uh, please bless us and help us to grow through your word by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 78. This is a wisdom psalm. And uh, <clears throat> as such, you're going to have a bunch of recounting happen. And we've seen that before, where we've seen psalms where the psalmist recounts a lot of things that God has done. This will be another psalm with a lot of recounting in it. Uh, but perhaps in a different way than what we've been seeing so far. Um, he's going to be showing and talking about God's provision and recounting what God has done, but also recounting what uh, God's people have done, both good and bad. So it's a different kind of recounting in that sense. And uh, you're going to see that as we continue on. The subtitle of this psalm is Tell the Coming Generation. A maskil of Asaph. And does anybody remember what a maskil is? Muskrat. It's not a it's not a baby, baby muskrat. Oh baby muskrat. I gave you a hint. I gave you I gave you a hint when I told you what kind of psalm this is at the, at the little intro. When I said this is a psalm of wisdom. So a maskil is a psalm of wisdom, right? Knowledge, imparting knowledge. <laughs> that's why I bring it up every time because you know you can get them you can get terms mixed up I think what did they say it takes 21 times before you remember something on average so <laughs> that's the average yeah <laughs> well, there you go, see? <laughs> that's why we'll just do it every time we run into it that's why we do Sela every once in a while too just because that comes up quite a bit see so, but hmm. I remember it. Next time you need to remember what. Shindo. Next time you remember what masculine means, you can say la, pause, and meditate on it, and then come up with the answer. Be like, Ooh. Be smarter. Uh, let's see, a masculine. Uh, let's see, say la. What's the other one that we've had quite a bit of? That one that nobody knows what it is. It starts with an M, and I can't remember what it is. Oh, It'll come to me. We really don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. Starts with an M. I'll think of it when we're we going through. Know. Let's start with verse 1 and go through verse 4 while we try and remember. <laughs> Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. This is a psalmist speaking. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Makes sense, right? Tell the coming generation. Now that's a pretty, first, first four verses pretty much encapsulates that. The first question that we're going to ask is, what does the psalmist say he is doing in verses 1 and 2? He says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old. So he's saying that he is going to... I'm sorry, what's that? Preaching. He's preaching, but he's using a parable. And he's saying, I'm going to recount the things of old. I'm going to, I'm going to recount things of old, things that happened for our forefathers... Kind of 
it's going to be implied here throughout this psalm that the reminding of this is to make sure that we don't do the same mistakes our forefathers did. <laughs> There's going to be a strong implication there. So he's going to be using the history of Israel as a parable, not only talking about God's great marvelous deeds but also and his wondrous works, but also God's discipline upon Israel for when it did not obey. So this whole thing is going to be type of a, of a parable here, a comparison story, so to speak. Question two. What do verses three and four mean? Verses three and four say this. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming or generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. If we take that uh, verse by verse, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. What, what just... It's pretty straightforward. What is he meaning by that? He's going to tell everything that the Lord has done. He's going to tell what the Lord has done. Kind of similar to what we were just saying, right? The purpose of the, of the song. He's not going to hide it from their children. Now, the reason he says that, there's no reason for him to say that if everything he's about to say is going to be really glowing, Right? Like God, of course, and everything God does is perfect. So anytime you're talking about God and his wondrous deeds and his, and his attributes, it's going to be a glowing kind of thing, right? But the reason he says we will not hide them from their children is because he's saying, eh, we're not going to hide our failures. God never fails. We have. We're going to remember all these things. We're not going to hide them from our children, but instead use it for teaching It says, but to tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. There's really a lot being said in these two verses, right? Not, not only does it say we're not going to hide our failures because we want to teach our children about what has happened in the past, but it also has a praising of God that is highlighted here, that the focus of, of Israel's faith is not in their obedience or their goodness, that, that's not what's going to get praised here. What's going to get praised here is God. God and his faithfulness and his glorious deeds and his might and his wonders. So he's really setting the stage in just these first four verses. We're not, I'm going to recount to you all the things that has happened. In other words, you're going to get a history lesson here of the relationship between the people of Israel and God. And it's, we're not going to hide any of the bad stuff. I'm, I'm going to tell you everything. Because some of it's not going to look good on our forefathers. But it all will show you why God is to be praised. It's all going to talk about God's glorious deeds, his might, and the wonders that he has done. Do you guys, anybody remember from last week's Bible study when, when, I, when, I, when I talked about the word wonders last week's Bible study, I said that typically in the Old Testament, when the word wonders is used in the Hebrew, it tends to highlight a particular event in the history of Israel. And it starts with X and ends in Otis. Does anybody remember? Exodus, yes. Very good. <laughs> so usually, whenever you see that word wonders in the Old Testament, you know that it's going to at least include the Exodus in some way, shape, or form. Might add other stuff as well. But you know that the events of the Exodus from Egypt are going to be part of what's about to be spoken of in Psalm 78. Just wanted to tie that together because it just so happened to come up right again in the very next psalm. All right, any questions so far? All right, moving on, verse 5. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, 
whose spirit was not faithful to God. Again, a lot said there, isn't there? Question three, what are the people of God told to do in verses five through eight and why? It says, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a new law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. Just in verse five, who's the he that established a testimony in Jacob? God. He's also the one who appointed a law in Israel. He's also the one who commanded our fathers to teach to their children. It's all God. God is, this is the psalmist describing how God commands Israel to remember his laws, to teach them to the coming generation, to remember the good and the bad and teach them so that they understand it is good to obey the Lord and bad things happen when you disobey the Lord. That's the general gist of verses 5 through 8, right? In verse 6, the next generation might know them, might know what God commands. And the children get born and to tell them and their children, so to tell the future generations. Why? So, and this is the why. We ask that in the second part of question 3. Why? Well, here's the answer, verse 7. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments so that they would not be like their fathers, stubborn and rebellious, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. A good word here would be testimony, right? R remember the testimony of who God is and what he told us to do and what his laws and commandments are. Teach them, learn them yourself, teach them to your children so that your children can teach them to your, their children so that they don't turn out like their fathers, so that they have hope in God, not forgetting the works of God, but will keep his commandments, right? Pretty straightforward. This is a command of God, by the way. That's Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. It's what's in our kids' room up on that board. Teach your children what God has said, and you do that all the time. You do it in your waking. You do it when you rise. You do it right before you go to sleep. It's constant. It's all the time. To keep God's commandments. Remember who God is. Remember what his commandments are. Does this make sense? This is the warning so that Israel doesn't become a, a, a generation after generation uh, stubborn like their forefathers. It's a warning. I mean, we see the history of Israel filled with apostasy, filled with um, idolatry, all the way from Egypt to the Promised Land, all kinds of mistakes, all kinds of sinfulness against God between, then, uh, between Exodus and the Promised Land, isn't there? And even after they entered the Promised Land, there's even still. So this is a great warning here. And this is a warning that we can take and, and use for ourselves too. As a people of God, we want to make sure that we teach our children what God has said and what God has done. You tell them about your own testimony. You tell them about the testimony in God's word, of course. But you also tell them your testimony of what God has done in you and where you have failed and how God has never failed. So that they will set their hope in God. They won't forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. How powerful is it if you sit down and, and speak to your grandchild or to your child and you tell them of not only the stories that you've been reading with them in the Bible, but then you tell them what God, the God of the Bible has done in your life. And how, you know, maybe you're telling a story of the Israelites and you say, yeah, they failed God here. You know what? There was a time where I did the exact same thing. And God restored me and God saved me. And God pulled me out of that, or God corrected me, right? God chastised me, pulled me out of that, put me on solid ground. Like, see what I mean? How much more so is that going to be teaching your kids? Because now the faith is real. Now it's not just some fairy tale story about, you know, a plush doll hippo and a plush doll giraffe and a plush uh, ark floating through their bathtub. You know, this is real. This is real, right? Well, that's how a lot of people, I think, think. You know, kids grow up and you get them a, a Fisher-Price Ark. And you think that you have taught them about God. 
that that's not teaching them about God. You know, like as kids get older, they understand that their parents make mistakes and sin, and they're watching you, and they're watching your life, and they're going to see how you really act with God. They're going to see if you're praying to God. They're going to see if you're asking for God's forgiveness. You're, they're going to see how you're acting. And they're going to see through that whether or not there's a testimony of God, who he is, what he's done, his commandments, if they really are important to you or if you're just giving lip service, right? If they're actually going to look for your faults where you fail. Absolutely. Of your... Yeah. The encouraging thing is... Be- yeah, exactly. The encouraging thing is... As, as they look for our faults, that's encouraging for believers because guess what? We're, we're filled with them. But our hope comes from what God does in spite of our faults. So it's an awesome gospel opportunity, but also a, you know, an opportunity to talk about God's righteousness imputed to us, given to us. It's an awesome opportunity to talk about God's sanctification, Right? How you can be at the same time righteous, yet a sinner at the same time, right? When we all get to heaven, we won't be able to say that anymore. We'll all be glorified. But they have to understand, and we have to tell them who God is, what God commands, how that's how we've done in that, and that we have not followed his commandments perfectly, but our hope is not in our perfect obedience, it's in his perfect faithfulness. Right, and that's where we put our faith in, and so it makes a huge difference when a kid sees that because they're going to absolutely spot every single fault. You hypocrite, right? You faker. I saw what you did. Yeah, I saw what you did. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and you know what? Kids grow up to be adults, and adults grow up to do that very same thing to Christianity in general, right? Look for the faults of any Christian and say, "Aha." Aha! See, double standard. You say this, but you do that. You say this, and you do this other thing. You know. So therefore, I don't. So therefore, Christianity is false. The Bible's false. God is false, right? So, God knows what He's doing when He tells His people to do something, right? So this is a really useful thing for us to pay attention to and do in our own lives, for our own children, our own grandchildren. We want to not forget the works of God. We want to have our hope in God. We want to keep his commandments. We don't want to be stubborn and rebellious. We don't want to be unfaithful to God. So this is, a, this is the prescription on, on what God says to do. What about, uh, well, let's move on. Verse 9. The Ephraimites, armed with a bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. So here's an example of somebody not doing what God just said to do, right? Immediately it goes into, hey, do this, and then an example from the past saying, this is what happens if you don't do it. So it's a warning with an example from history. The Ephraimites, armed with a bow, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but they refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it. He made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them out with a cloud, and in the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Question what is verses 9 through 11 referring to and who were the Ephraimites it says the Ephraimites armed with the bow turned back on the day of battle they did not keep God's covenant but refused to walk according to his law they forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them what are those verses referring to it is actually talking about a different time. Now, later on, you've got to remember, I said verses 9 through 11. Okay? You'd be right if I asked about the rest of the verses. Oh, well, okay? that's what you thought. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so that's why I'm clarifying, right? Well, right now, we're just, we read verses 9 through 16. Yeah. But question 4, I'm just asking about verses 9 through 11. What's it talking about? It's talking, in just verses 9 through 11... 
who, whoever's being referred to here, did they do what God said or not? No. no. And who it's referring to is the Ephraimites. They're armed with a bow. They were turned back on the day of battle. Does that sound like God allowed them to win the victory or that God took the victory from them? He took the victory from them. He didn't help them. Because they turned back. Why? Because, verse 10, they did not keep God's covenant. So a very specific group of people, the Ephraimites, armed with a bow, they were turned back on the day of battle. They lost. They retreated. They fled. Why? Verse 10, they did not keep God's covenant but refused to walk according to his law. They also forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. The Ephraimites were uh, the sons of Ephraim. That's a tribe of Israel. Ephraim is, is a general symbol of idolatry in Israel's history. So if I'm a psalmist, and I'm writing out a song talking of wisdom, a psalm of wisdom. And I'm going to talk to you about how God wants you to remember who he is, what he's commanded, and teach that to your children and your children's children so that you don't forget God's work and so that you will be blessed and that God's name will be glorified, right? And I warn you that things go bad if you don't do that. I'm going to immediately give you an example of how things went bad for somebody who didn't do that. And that's exactly what's happening here. And that's why the sons of Ephraim are mentioned. They are a general symbol of idolatry because of their early affiliation with idolatry, (coughs) which we find a lot of places. But just to give you one example, you can look into Judges chapter 18. They are associated with the northern tribes of Israel. You'll also see that they're associated with a, another place called Shiloh, which you might have heard before. Shiloh was a place that could have been a place of worship. It could have been Jerusalem, but it wasn't. Instead, Jerusalem became Jerusalem. Shiloh could have, but it wasn't. Why? Idolatry unfaithfulness to God. Why? Because they did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot the works and wonders that he had done. They didn't keep God's law in Judges 1. They did not drive out the Canaanites from their part of the promised land. God says, drive out the Canaanites. Don't let any of them stick around. Get rid of them all. And the tribe of Ephraim goes, well, maybe the few of them can stay, right? Ignoring God's command, that does not go well for them. When when the people finally made it into the promised land, they participated in idolatry. Putting other things and including themselves, above God. Ignoring the wonders that they had been shown. This is after they walked through the water, right? This is after that. They, they, manna in the desert. A cloud that they were able to follow during the day and a pillar of fire that they were able to follow at night. All these miraculous wonders... And what do they do? They turn their back on God in idolatry. Crazy, right? Crazy. How can it be? How can it be? Question five. Now, Jill, here's your, here's your moment to shine. Yep. What is being described in verses 12 through 16? In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea. He let them pass through it. He made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and at night, a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly. As from the deep, he made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Jill, what's that describing? Excellent. Yes, yes. <laughs> I remember it. 
And I would, I would add to that and say, not only is it the Exodus, but sometimes it helps to add on that this is also Israel's time in the wilderness. Th those can mean the same thing. Sometimes when you say Exodus, you're meaning the entire book of Exodus, right? And what it recounted. But just to make sure that nobody's forgetting, it's not just the Exodus from Egypt, but the time in between God takes them out of Egypt and brings them to the Promised Land, which is known as the time in the wilderness. So it's that whole time of Exodus there. And it's referring to the parting of the Red Sea, the water standing like a heap, um, him leading them with a cloud. This is all Exodus. Exodus, Exodus, Exodus. He caused rocks to split in the wilderness. That's Exodus. That's Exodus 17. It's also mentioned in Numbers 20. So keep in mind all these amazing things that the psalmist just recounted, right? In the Exodus. And we go right to verse 17 where he says, yet. In other words, in spite of all this, they sinned still more against God, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob, which is another name for Israel. His anger rose against Israel. Because they did not, why? Because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. Yet, so here's another, in spite of this, yet, verse 23, God commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them grain from heaven. And man ate of the bread of the angels, and he sent them food in abundance, he caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out of the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings. And they ate, and they were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving, while food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them. And he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. Wow. More recounting of Israel's past. Their time in Exodus. Their time in the wilderness. Okay. Question six. What was Israel guilty of in verses 17 through 20? Let me read those verses. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also get bread or provide meat for his people? What if we were to take that uh, verse by verse. Verse 17 sets the stage, right? They sinned more against God, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. So that just sets the stage. Verse 18 gives the first indication of what they did specifically. And it says what? They did what? They, te they tested God in their heart. And how did they do it according to verse 18? By demanding what? The food that they craved. The food that they craved. Imagine, imagine, if you will, that uh, you are trapped in the middle of the desert and you have nothing. You pray to God and you say, God, please save me. And a raven flies by and drops this basket. A, a, what's that, Laudenberger? Is that the? Laudenberger. Drops a Laudenberger basket filled with, filled with water and filled with tasty bread, right? Or uh, Nichols bread, okay? Well, okay. But you're starving. You're in the middle of the desert. Okay. Right? So, so you're starving. You have no water. You have no food. You pray to God. He sends a raven, drops a long burger basket with water and tasty bread in it. And you open up the basket and you go, oh. 
eh. Right? So, so there, is a, there is a sin going on there of what? What's the sin there? You say, God, you know, can't you, I, I would have really liked the chicken. A KFC pot pie sounds pretty good right now, Lord. And you know, water is just so flavorless. I could have used a Coke, right? So greedy. greedy. What are some other words that kind of come to your mind? Unthankful. Unthankful. What's a word that starts with come and ends in clean? Complainers. Yeah. <laughs> also, the fact that no, you know, had nothing to complain about. They complain about everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mindset, right? Attitude. Not a, not a spirit of thankfulness or gratefulness at all. Instead, they are. God, God is providing, right? But they're complaining about how God is providing. And they're also complaining about, which is insolence, by the way. To complain about how God is providing is insolence. But they're also complaining about his timing, right? Which is impatience. So they're guilty of all these things that we've mentioned. They're rebelling against the Most High in the desert. You're dissatisfied with God when you're dissatisfied with how he is providing for you. You can't separate those two things. You can't say, well, no, 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 I'm, I'm still good with God. I'm just mad about and disappointed in the way that he's treating me. Well, so then you're dissatisfied with God. No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm just not happy with the water and the bread. I would rather have something else, meat. Well, no, you're, you are dissatisfied with God's provision. They are, this rebellion, they're complaining. The way they're complaining too, let's, let's move on. So we got, we got to verse 18, right? They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. Verse 19, here's another thing they're guilty of. They spoke against God. And how did they speak against God? They sarcastically said, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Do you, do you guys understand what they're saying there? What's the matter, God? Aren't you powerful enough to make a, a table for us, your people, in the wilderness? It sounds like they're mocking him. Yeah. You call this a spread? What's the matter, God? Can't you do better than this? Ugh. I mean, hearing that, yeah, I mean, it makes, it makes me clench up and go, Ugh, you know. Uh, you're complaining against God. And then they continue on. We're Verse not trusting in God either. Exactly. That's the that's the that's the ipso facto of it, right? All this is showing a distrust in God and a speaking against God. They're, they're not saying, like, oh God, we really would like some meat, but we understand that you know best. I'm gonna take whatever you give. No, they're not speaking that way at all. The, the, can God spread a table in the wilderness? What's the matter with this God of ours? I mean, what? Bread is all. Is the best he can do? He can't do a little meat? Oh, can you imagine? Uh, he str- Here's verse 20. It continues. He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also get, you could say can't. Can't he also give bread or provide meat for his people? God has been showing that he can provide for his people just fine. They are complaining. When they're talking about striking the rock, that's Numbers 20. So the psalmist is recounting all these things that happened in the Exodus and that happened in the wilderness. These do not show well, right? These do not show well. This is stubbornness. This is rebellion. This is a a cautionary tale that the psalmist is, is telling, and it's real. All right, question seven. What do we learn about Israel and what do we learn about God from verses, now I should have said 21 through 25. That's an oops. I know, I know. I noticed that after I already printed all the copies, and that was a lot of paper for these ones, so I was like, oh, you're just going to have to scribble. <laughs> so this is, this is what do we learn about Israel and what do we learn about God from verses 21 through 25. 
which say this, therefore, when the Lord heard, so when the Lord heard all this, all this griping and this complaining and this dissatisfaction, and like Bob said, this distrust of him, he was happy. No, it says he was full of wrath. He's full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob. His anger rose against Israel. Is there a, is there a price to pay if you make God angry? Yeah. yeah. He is not like Santa Claus or some kind of um, super soft grandpa who is just going to let you run all over him. And oh, well, no big deal, you know. No, that is not how God operates. Verse 22, because they did all this. Now, here's the hint. You might be saying to yourself, why would they do this? Why would they say that? Why would they be doing what we just got done reading that they were doing? Here's verse 22. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. Unbelievers. Now we say that, right? What's God have to do? These people have seen all these yeah. wonders, and yet they still do not believe in God. John six forty four. <laughs> no one comes to the Father unless the Father drags them or draws them to himself. So the way that God saved people hasn't changed. God must draw them to faith. God must gift them faith, gift them the grace or else it doesn't matter what wonders they see. They will not believe in God and will not trust him. We see that in Revelation, don't we? When all these amazing wonders are happening that people are even saying, it's God. It has to be God who's throwing these millstones down on people. And we'll crawl into caves and, and we'll complain and wail and wish for death. But we won't repent. We won't trust in God. We won't seek him for his saving power. Those people won't do that, even though they are witness to wondrous events that are obviously above man-made creation. So this is going to stand true for the whole test of time. Until the end of the age, this will always be the case. That if this is what people will do because they do not believe in God and do not trust in his saving power. So, what do you learn about Israel just from, from those two verses, 21 and 22? They you, didn't trust God in his power. Yeah. There were people amongst the people that God was saving who he did not save. And those people did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. And they were the ones who were going, God, why can't we have meat? Did they reap his benefits but didn't even realize. Yeah, they got, they got part of a general grace yeah. and a general benefit from just being amongst right. the people that God was saving. But they did not reap the full benefit that faith and trust in God gives. So they could say that we're sons of Abraham by blood. Every person in Israel could say that. But they couldn't say that they were spiritual sons of Abraham. Because only those who really did have faith in God for saving power and, and trust in God, only they are truly spiritual sons of Abraham. Right? So we learn that. Oof, they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. Now, here's what, here's what we're going to learn about God. Not only do we already learn that God gets angry, right? That there's con but that there's, there's consequences too because of God's anger. But here's something else we'll learn about God, starting in verse 23. Yet... In spite of this, God commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. Let me keep going. And he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels and he sent them food in abundance. What's happening there? God's being merciful. Yeah, God is being merciful in spite of their complaints. In spite of them not believing in him or trusting in his saving power. God still, he's so long-suffering. He still did something nice for them even though they didn't deserve jack squat. Those who did not trust in him ate of the same manna as those who did. Okay? Right now, in the midst of this world, 
you have people who are benefiting from God's grace and God's mercy in a general sense, in the same way that we who trust in him and his saving power are. We all get to experience families in some way, shape, or form. You all get to eat and enjoy eating, right? We all get to see the sun. We all get to breathe the same air. We all get to appreciate a sunrise or a sunset, right? These are general graces that everyone is privy to, regardless of whether they trust God or don't trust God. See, God's characteristics have stayed exactly the same. But you can recognize from biblical history that even though God has general grace that he pours out on everybody, right? The sun shines on the wicked and the good. But he does have a special kind of love and treatment for those who do put their faith and trust in him and show that faith and trust to be genuine by a desire to be obedient, right? They have a special kind of love and treatment from God, a grace that goes beyond the general grace. So, there's, so that's what we're talking about here is those distinctions. And it's good to make those distinctions. What about question eight? What incident is being recounted in verses 26 through 31? It says this. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens. Remember, this is in the context. Context hasn't changed. So we're still talking about yet God did this. So these people complain, they gripe, and all this other stuff. Yet God did this. So God still sent manna. You ungrateful little dirtbags. Still sending them manna. Does that mean they just get off scot-free? Well, let's see. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power, he let out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust. Remember what they were complaining for? Meat. You little dirtbags, you want meat? I'll send you meat. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas, he let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings. Can you imagine? <laughs> and they ate and were filled, for he gave them what they craved. Notice it doesn't say what they needed. Gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them. And he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. The incident that's being recounted in verses 26 through 31 is talking about the quail that God sent in Numbers 11. Oh, God sent a meat, but he also sent a plague because of the meat. Is there a price to be paid for disobedience to God? Yes. Sometimes that price is paid immediately. Other times that price is paid after a while. Sometimes that price won't be paid until you stand before God at judgment. But the price will always be paid. Sometimes always spiritually and sometimes physically and spiritually. Right? They're going to have to answer for their, for their rebellion against God, not only physically, here in this judgment, but also when they stand before him at the great white throne. Because they don't have faith in God, which means they don't have faith in Christ, which means that they have no salvation from their sins, which means they must answer for all their sins and rebellion themselves. A terrifying thought. The anger of God rose up against them. He killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel. God did that for a reason. Can you imagine why God would choose to, to kill the strongest? Imagine you're sitting in your tent and all of a sudden you hear this. Blah, 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 blah. Somebody comes in. You won't believe it. You got to get out of here. You come outside and you're like, what in the? All these quails are just boom, 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 dropping from the air. And you're like, ho, ho, ho. Happy days are here again. God sent us meat. Right? And in the middle of eating your, you know, thigh. Now, 
It says specifically that God killed the strongest of them, laying low the young men of Israel. Why would God do that? Any show his power. Oh! We both said that. Not only to show his power, you're right. To show his power, but let me add just a little bit to it. To, to make sure that people knew it was by his power. Right? Because, look, if it was a bunch of 90-year-olds... <laughs> You're going to be like, look, it was their time, right? Yeah. Or you might say, look, uh, you know, Bev was never good at eating chickens or quail. She always choked on the bone. She probably just choked on the bone. She's old, whatever, right? Or you'd say, oh, you know, the meat was too hardy for them, so they died. No, 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 no. These are the strongest. The strongest. There is no doubt then that this is of God and a judgment of God on these people. Right? That's absolutely why God did that. Also, because there's another thing to be said. If, if you don't believe in God, and let's say you're an atheist, and you're in this group of Israelites, and you say to yourself, look, I don't believe in God, I don't trust in him, and I don't trust in his power, and I don't tr trust in his saving, you know, we're strong. We, we are strong men. We have lots of strong men here. We can take care of ourselves. We can survive because I'm strong and all these other men I know are strong, right? So who are they relying on in their youth and their strength? Themselves. Instead of God. So what is God doing also when he wipes out the strongest and the young men of Israel? He's telling them, Rely on me. You had your faith in the wrong place. Don't gripe against me. Don't speak against me. Don't disobey me and be rebellious against me. And don't rely on yourselves instead of me. This is taking Israel out to the woodshed. A number of times. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which, which, you know, yeah, I was just going to say, add us all to the group of being slow learners, right? If it wasn't for God's mercy, I mean, we would all be in this, gone, be in the same boat. How many times, I think to myself, how many times before you opened my eyes, Lord, did I rebelliously sin against you, which is bad enough. And then I say, how many times have I rebelliously sinned against you even after you've opened my eyes? Oof, that's the one that gets me. Oof. But by his grace and his mercy, right? That's why we, above all, should be the most forgiving, should be the most willing to forgive, the most humble. <sighs> what do I, who am I? What do I have? Nothing, right? I have nothing. I, all that God has given me is, is because of him, not because of me. I'm not awesome. He's awesome. Any thoughts so far as before we move to the next section of Scripture? It just, it just reminds me of when I was reading through the Old Testament. And every, every time I'd read, and they rebelled, and I'm like, <laughs> how many times does he have to murder half of them? Before they get it through their heads. And then I thought, well, how many times do we have to be murdered before we get through our heads? Well, I think that uh, while I wouldn't use the word murder, murder. but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, how many times does it take? And the answer is our entire lives. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, there, there has been no one who has been glorified prior to getting to heaven. Christ, but of course, he is, he is perfectly God and perfectly man. Not us. None of us have ever gotten there. There's a Wesleyan teaching that, that once you uh, are saved, that you'll no longer sin. That must be the guy that was on the uh, Source Guardian? No, it was on that the, is a, that the is... other day that said, once you're saved, you do not sin. You can't. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how that's going, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, makes yeah, you think of 1 John. You know, those who say they have no sin... Make God a liar. That's exactly what I put up there. Because mm -hmm. you still sin? 
if you're honest with yourself. It makes me think they're opening the door to doing what they want. Well, I think part of it's that. I think the other part of it is legalism. You know, it's kind of it's it's one or the other. It's either antinomianism, which is a fancy way of saying anti-law, uh, meaning that the laws no longer apply to us because Christ has paid the price for all the sin. Therefore, do as you wish. Right? That's antinomianism. Or another term for that is hyper grace, where where it doesn't matter what you do because Christ has paid the price, so you are free and clear, my friend. No, that's not biblical, of course. The other way is legalism. That's the other side of it, where it's like, well, you can't do this, you must do this, you can't do this, you must do this. And then that's how you're going to show uh, how you're going to... A lot of times the, the legalism is uh, a works-based religion. Sometimes it gets wrapped up confusingly with uh, a grace, but that you have to have that you're going to show specific works outside of grace in a legalistic way outside of what scripture tells you, right? That's what I mean by a legalistic way in those terms. But in other words, like the Church of Christ says, you have to be baptized to be saved. Yeah, I think, you know, that would be, if you wanted to make it more complicated, that's a good way of phrasing it. Because why do we baptize? We baptize because it was commanded by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. told us to baptize. So if you are saved... It is another way of saying, I view Christ as my Savior, my Lord, and my God, and I want to do what he tells us to do. Therefore, it is a sign of the genuineness of my salvation that I want to be obedient to what Christ has said to do. Therefore, I, I, that's why I'm going to get baptized. Now, if I phrase it that way really well, thumbs up, right? That's a thumbs up. That's biblical. But if I phrase it in such a way where I say, um, oh, you want to be saved? You, you must be baptized because baptism is how you are saved. Now that is unbiblical. So it depends, and you can see how you could really, just by changing a little bit of verbiage, you can blur those lines very, very easily. So, good thoughts. All right, let's move on. Verse 32. In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. When he killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly, I bet. They remembered that God was their rock, the Most High God, their Redeemer. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast towards him. They were not faithful to his covenant. In other words, they just said what they needed to say, to, to, what they thought they needed to say to get out of danger. Get out of jail. Verse 38, Yet he, God, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. There's your, there's your anti-reincarnation statement. Okay. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. Somebody says, oh, I'm the reincarnation of uh, Geronimo. You'd be like, no, you're a wind that passes and comes not again. <laughs> Verse 40, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Their time in the desert was not a good time. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Good times. Yeah, really. This, this, is, this tells you the heart of, of man. Jeremiah 17, 9, right? Deceitful, wicked sick. This is the heart of man. In spite of wonders, in spite of all these amazing things, instead of God's perfect faithfulness and provision, they test him again and again, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness, how often they grieved him in the desert, they provoked the Holy One of Israel. That's us. There's a great, um, Stephen Lawson has a really good sermon that he talks about um, 
God's sovereignty and salvation. And one of the illustrations that he gives is a medical one. And what it is, is he says, mankind is one of three things. You are either well, or you are sick, or you are dead. Okay? Mankind is well, mankind is sick, or mankind is dead. All of mankind. All right? So when you read what we're reading now in Psalm 78, and you see how mankind default reacts to God, in his perfect faithfulness, in his perfect provision, after saving them out of misery and slaves in Egypt, bringing them to a promised land, flowing with milk and honey, and you see that they, as flesh, rebel against him in the wilderness, grieving him in the desert, testing God again and again, and provoking the Holy One of Israel. What? After everything God has done? Certainly man is not well, and if you say man is sick, it makes it the, the illustration that was used is that to say man as well is to say nothing's wrong, right? Or that only minor things are wrong here and there, but not a big deal at all, can be handled at any time, right? Which is obviously biblically incorrect, spiritually speaking. To say that mankind is only sick is to say that you're laying sick in the bed and there's a, a bottle of the antidote and it's on the table next to you and, and you're expected to reach over and grab it in your sickness and take that medicine yourself, right? Or you're sick, but you're not, you're not that bad off. The medicine's right there. If you just reach over and take it yourself, right? Or you're dead. And what can a dead man do? You can't reach over and grab that antidote because you're dead. You can't reach it. You don't have the strength to reach it. You don't have the wherewithal to reach it. You, can't, you don't have even the thought to take it because you are dead. You don't have thought. You can't move. You can't will anything because you're dead. You're dead. This illustrates that spiritual deadness. This is how hopeless we are without God. That even in a situation like that, if it wasn't for God moving inside of his own people to regenerate them and save them, granting them faith through grace, there's no way they would choose them. They'd have the same response as the Israelites here, these unfaithful ones. Rebelling against God, grieving him again and again, testing him again and again, provoking him again and again. So, question eight, uh, nine. Describe the meaning of verses 32 through 41. This is, uh, again, the history of Israel in the wilderness. This is uh, recounted in Numbers. Verse 32, if we go kind of bit by bit here. In spite of all of this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. In spite of all this, was Israel faithful or faithless? Yeah, in the wilderness, they were faithless. In spite of all of this, somehow people still were faithless. Boy, that speaks to our deadness, spiritually speaking. Verses 33 and 34 say, So he made their days vanish like a breath. God! God made their days vanish like a breath, their years in terror. When he killed them, he sought, they sought him. <laughs> when they killed him, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. In the time in the wilderness, it is filled with Israel's rebellion and then God's punishment for that rebellion and then Israel's rebellion and then God's punishment for that rebellion and then Israel's rebellion and then God's punishment for that rebellion. It's filled with that. He killed some of them, verse 34, and then they sought him. So what does that tell you? God, they rebel, God punishes them, and then they seek him. But when they seek him, do you think it's genuine or not? Because it's only temporary. So because the seeking of God is only temporary, does, what does that tell you? Is it genuine seeking or not? No. No, it's not genuine. Because it's only temporary. A genuine, and this is true today, a genuine seeking of God is a looking to be uh, a, a, a contrition, a desire to be made right with him. So a genuine seeking of God is to say, God, I want to be made right with you, which is contrition. 
You humble yourself because you're admitting that you are who God says you are, a sinner, and that you need saving. That is not something that happens temporarily. That is something that is repentance, a change of mind, which brings a change of direction, which brings a change of life. And so that is not temporary. And so we see here that is it possible for someone to give God lip service and then turn around and be like, yeah, absolutely. You can give God lip service and then turn around and do your own thing. That certainly happens. But not to the genuine seekers of God. They wouldn't do it temporarily. About verses 35 through 37, they remembered that God was their rock, the Most High God, their Redeemer, but they flattered Him with their mouths. They lied to Him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast towards them, towards Him. They were not faithful to His covenant. So, in other words, God starts striking people down and passing judgment. God, please spare me. You are the most high, I think is what you want to hear. And uh, you are my place of refuge and protection, I think is what I'm supposed to say. Uh, please don't smite me, oh great smiter. <laughs> Keep me uh, alive and I will serve you. And God doesn't smite them. And after a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, guess what? Their, their steadfastness was not true. They start, again. they start again. They proved they weren't genuine because they were not faithful to his covenant, which is another way of saying they were disobedient. But they were foolish enough to think that God didn't know that. Yes, yes the same thing I was saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they complain about God, they commit adultery. They don't want to enter the promised land when they finally get there. They're too scared to enter the promised land, right? So not trusting in God in that way either. I mean, constantly not trusting in God. And they prove that they're not really genuinely seeking after God. They prove that they're not genuinely trusting in God because they are not faithful to his covenant, which is another way of saying that they have zero desire to be obedient. It doesn't say that they must be perfectly obedient. They don't have a desire to be obedient. That's the difference. That's one of the marks of salvation is that you desire to be obedient and you are flummoxed. You are frustrated and angry with your sin and you hate when you're disobedient and it drives you mad. You hate it because you desire obedience. That's a mark of genuine salvation. But if you just give God lip service, you're going to go right back to doing your own thing regardless of whatever God has commanded, which is a sign that you don't trust him, i.e. you're not saved. What about verses 38 and 39? Yet he, God, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all of his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. God, could God have destroyed all of Israel at any time? Yeah. God could have destroyed all of Israel at any time. Could God have destroyed just the unbelieving ones, all of them at once, just leaving the believing Israelites? Sure. sure. Could have done that. Absolutely. But God's, God did not. He chose to not completely destroy Israel when he could have. He, they, they averted punishment not because they were faithful, not because they were obedient, but because God was merciful. These, this is over a huge period of time. This is going on, what, 100 years? 40. 40 years. So, so generations. Mm -hmm. So again, going back to the beginning, the need to retell the story mm -hmm. for the new generation. Yeah, you have to have, you know, the time in the wilderness was 40 years, but the, but the time between Exodus and the time of the writing of the psalm was hundreds. So, yeah, you need to tell this again and again and again. You can't just assume, right? And this is how, you know, when people assume things, especially when you grow up in the church and so on and so forth, you assume that your children are learning things, 
you assume that they're gaining knowledge of, of God's word and all these other things. But the only way to be absolutely sure is to tell them yourself. And honestly, Scripture says that that's the parent's job. It's the parent's job to teach up the children mm-hmm. the way that they should go. And so it is the parent's job to be able to do that. And so, yes, the church has a role in doing that, but it, it falls scripturally on the parents. And so, yeah, you have to recount that. So we're recounting when we tell Bible stories uh, from Gen- Genesis through Revelation, every chapter of the Bible, when we tell the story in each one of those chapters, we're recounting God's faithfulness, who he is. We're recounting the failures of a sinful human nature, human and woman. And then we relate that personally to the children through our own lives and how God has, how the same things apply and have been proven true in our own lives. Here's where I was faithless and when I rebelled and here's where God finally broke me of that rebellion and this is how it's changed my life and this, you know, and that's, this is the gospel and here's my testimony of how the gospel changed me. And then you can, how much more powerful, like I said at the beginning, is that for you as a parent or a grandparent to be able to use those things to add to the, the, the scripture? Because it's, it's showing, just like we're doing now, as we're reading this, I'm sure you're thinking of your own rebellion, you're thinking of people that you know in rebellion and those things. And in the same powerful, it has a much more powerful, especially if you're our, our kids, because our kids are going to be like, Wow. That makes more sense now because they can see it in the light of the lives of their parents or grandparents. So it makes the Bible real. It makes the Bible real. What about? Uh, we also fail as parents, also. Right. Which is, and the thing is, is like, look, we're gonna fail. You don't want to set yourself up with your kids as as perfect. You want to set God up as perfect, and how He never fails. Which is why. You know, why are you calm in any situation? Because even if you fail, you know your God won't. How can you be, you know, what happened? Why are you not sad that grandpa died? Well, because grandpa was saved. And so because I, you know, we believe what the Bible says. So he, he believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I know that I know that I know that where he is. So then I'm not afraid of missing him. I know I'll get to see him again. So, you know, all these different, you know, it's a, our failures are just as much a gospel opportunity and a learning opportunity for ourselves and our children as our, su- our successes. I think it's more powerful. Yeah. Failures are more powerful. Yeah. Same goes for church. Right. Yeah. Right. And you're willing to share that failure. Yeah. Hey, listen, I did this. Yeah. Hey, you don't want to do this. Yeah. No. Same goes for church discipline, too. You know, it is an opportunity for a church to learn when you do church discipline. You might be disciplining one person in particular, and that person will either accept that discipline, repent, and be pulled back into the flock, or they'll reject the discipline and they'll be taken out of the church. But either way, you're showing the importance of what God's word is, and then you're also teaching the church, like this is how the church stays pure. This is how the church shows the significance of sin. And so then failings in that to do that are even a way to, to teach. So like if a church isn't doing discipline, like if I'm talking to a pastor and they go, oh yeah, I had this guy, uh, you know, he was on Instagram and he was swearing up a storm and he was flipping off people and he was doing all these different things and he was just, and he's a, he's a pastor in our church. Like, wait, what? You know, what, what did you say to him? Well, nothing. Wait, what? You have other people in your church who are seeing these things, right? So now you need to see that this is something that needs to be corrected. So if you didn't correct it right away, there's still opportunity to correct it and still an opportunity to teach by saying, look, this should have been corrected. It wasn't. Now we're correcting. And now we're going to move in a different direction. And this is why, right? That's failure is teachable moment because I've, I've probably failed more than I succeed. So... That is just, again, oh, thank the Lord for grace and mercy and that, and that I am not saved by my perfection or my obedience or my good works. I'm saved by my faith in Christ's perfection and his obedience and his good works. And it's my desire to follow in his footsteps that shows the proof of my salvation being genuine. But yeah, I think, like you said, it's, it's, I think it's really powerful. 
Were you ever part of Church Michael, who you actually saw? That I, not that I was leading. Not, whenever I was not in leadership, no. Any church that I've been, I, there was only one other church that I was in a leadership role that I was able to do that. And did not go over well because the entire church was not on the same page. So, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. That's foundational to a church. So if your whole church is not on the same page with that, you're going to have a heck of a time. Because now you're going to have half the people who want to confront sin and the other half who don't. Now the reason to confront it should be biblical. Not, I'm going to get on my soapbox. No. Or I'm better than this person. No, nope. it's just biblical. But the reasons to not confront it could be numerous. Maybe people don't, a lot of people don't want to confront sin because they don't think they should because they have a bunch of sin in their own life and they don't want that to be pulled forward in the midst of them trying to pull forward sin in somebody else's life. So it becomes, well, I don't, you know, well, can't we all just get along? So then it, it lessens, the, it lessens the, the, the viewpoint of sin. So it makes sin acceptable in the church. Which, how can, you, how can you do that? You see it all the time. It's much more common for churches not to do any kind of discipline. Yeah. Um, because what you'll end up having is you'll have, um, for whatever reason, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter the reason that they refuse to do church discipline. The fact of the matter is, is that the refusal to do church discipline will keep the church impure. It lessens the, it lessens the cost of the cross because Christ had to go to the cross for the sins of the people that he saved. It's the only way. So you're lessening the cost of the cross. And what you end up having happen is a lot of times, sometimes uh, a church won't confront sin because, well, you don't want to upset anybody. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. It's not comfortable. It's going to make, it's going to make my weekend go bad. Uh, I'm going to get angry emails. Uh, that person might stop coming or stop giving. Uh, that person gives a lot. Or, well, if I confront this one, I'm going to have to confront that one. And I'm willing to confront this one, but that one's a mess. That's a time bomb. I don't even want to touch that one. See what I mean? And that's what ends up happening. So then you have your church that's already filled with you know, sheep and goats. Now you have it getting filled with more and more acceptable sin. And so now people look around and be like, and, and look, a, a, a church is not blind and deaf. A church will look around and be like, did you hear Cindy's having an affair with, with uh, Stephen? I'd be like, what? No, I didn't hear that. Oh, yes, it's been going on for quite some time. Well, does the pastor know about it? Well, I know that they've talked about it at elders' meetings, but I don't know beyond that, uh, Right. So then that goes on for years, right? Or um, did you hear what happened? So-and-so's daughter was caught out, you know, after midnight with a group of other kids drinking and and partying and high on drugs and da-da-da-da-da. What? Oh, yeah, she's been doing that for as long as she's been out and about. Well, has anybody confronted? Well, no. Oh. So what are you going to... Enough of those things happen. The church starts to believe that it's no big deal that it's just lip service. When I sit there and say, do not sin, have a desire, or pray, pray with me, let's have a desire for purity, faithfulness, and obedience. That's just show. That's what people start to believe. It's just a show. It's not real. It's just a show. That's what they say and do on Sunday. But the rest of the week, everybody kind of knows it's an unspoken, agreed upon rule that you do what you want to do and I'll do what I want to do and it doesn't really matter, right? That only hurts the church. Like, you have to be putting sin to death daily. Like, always fighting against it. Always fighting against false teaching. Always fighting against sin and the desires of the flesh. Always. Always. We will never stop doing that. It is a constant war of the church until Christ's return. We'll always be doing that. And when you don't do that, that's how churches implode from the inside out. They implode from the inside out. Because they're not focused on Christ, not focused on God's word. They're not interested in in sticking to God's word. It's like Paul tells Timothy. The church must be a buttress of truth or a stronghold of truth. It must be. So you have to defend its purity at all costs. You can't allow 
You know, you find out that Cindy's sleeping with Steve and Steve's an elder. Steve's gone. Steve's gone. And he can repent, right, and still be part of that church as a repentant, forgive man, but he's no longer an elder. For certain, ain't no way. And so those kind of things, like sin, consequence, sin, consequence, right? But you don't see that. You don't see that. But that's the gospel. The gospel is an affront. It's a confrontation of sin. What's the one thing that most churches hate to do? Confront sin. But that's what the gospel is. You have to confront sin with the gospel. Like that's, I can't give the gospel without confronting sin. I, you know what it sounds like when you, when you give the gospel without confronting sin? Not the gospel. <laughs> Because this is what it sounds. This, this is what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like when you when you give a false gospel without confronting sin. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He has a great plan for your life. That's it. Not yet. Loves you just the way you are. Um, you know, you're you're amazing and you are wonderful and you are insert all good adjectives here instead of the truth which is you are at enmity with God and you should tremble because God is holy and you are not and here's all the different ways that we sin against God and God God has the right to send us all to hell this very second but in his great mercy and love he has made a way by faith alone in Christ alone and then you explain the gospel. But you have, you can only give the gospel if you present the problem with sin. And sin is only a problem when it's a problem. How can I stand up? If I'm a church that just lets anything go and I never do any kind of discipline whatsoever, how can I stand up and talk about how heinous sin is when you don't treat it heinously? Where's the sense of urgency then? Right? I don't know how we got off in that bunny trail. Let's finish up. Uh, I asked you. <laughs> well, you go. Notice how I included all of us in that. We, not just me. Yeah, usually you point me out. <laughs> <laughs> the last part is verses 40 and 41, where it says, How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. This would be the, the, the time in the wilderness is characterized by what you read in verses 40 and 41. Rebellion, often, against God, grieving God. You know the difference between a sin, someone who's saved and someone who's not saved? Someone who's saved when they sin, it grieves you. It grieves you that you have hurt God and that you have failed God. And that you have sinned against him. It grieves you when you're saved. When you're unsaved, you don't really care. You don't really care. You might be concerned that you got caught. Which is when you give lip service, right? Oh, please don't sentence me too hard. Oh, please don't smite me. Oh, great smiter. Please don't. Right? But it's not really a, God, I am a sinner. And you have a right to do with me whatever you want. You could destroy me. And I could say nothing about it because I deserve it. But if it pleases you, please show me mercy, right? And make me more like your son in whom you were well pleased, right? That's the prayer of someone who's saved. Somebody who desires obedience and desires holiness and desires sinlessness, but recognizes that we can't do it, which is why you love God all the more. We can quit there for tonight, so hang on to your studies because we'll pick up in verse 42 next time.